My name is Bettina Warburg. I'm a researcher of transformative technologies and co-founder of Animal Ventures. Today, I've been challenged to explain one concept at five levels of increasing complexity. My topic is blockchain technology. Blockchain is a new network, and it's going to help us decentralize trade, allowing us to do a lot of our transactions much more peer-to-peer -peer directly and lower our use of intermediaries like companies or banks maybe. I think today everyone can leave understanding something about blockchain at some level. Do you know what we're going to talk about today? It's called blockchain. What's blockchain? That's a really good question. It's actually a way that we can trade. Do you know what trade is? Mm -hmm. it's, when, it's when you take turns your sign. That's when you give up most of what you want, right? When you give up most of what you want? Well, sometimes that definitely happens for sure. What if I told you that there's a kind of technology that I work on that means you could trade with any kid all over the world? Really? Yeah. If I could trade with any kid, I would trade, well, I would trade something I don't like so much. That's probably a good idea. Maybe somebody else likes it more than you do. So normally, when people trade, they have to go to the store or they have to know the person so that they can get what they asked for. With blockchain, you can make that exact same trade, but you don't need the store and you don't even necessarily need to know the other person. Really? Really? So Ian, do you know what blockchain is? No. Have you ever traded or sold anything? Actually, I'm selling my computer on eBay right now. That's amazing. What made you decide to trade on eBay? Um, well, I, I mean, I've heard of it and I trust it a lot because there's they have like all of their guarantees. So I, I know that I'm going to get money and the person's going to get what they want. So what if I told you that blockchain technology is basically a tool where you can do the exact same thing but it goes to you and I directly. You wouldn't need an eBay or a brand in between. That's cool. And there's a lot of those kinds of middlemen like in our society today, right? We have a lot of banks, we have yeah. a lot of companies that sort of help us make sure that our trades happen. Mm -hmm. But if we could guarantee the same trade using technology as sort of like a technological trust, mm -hmm. then we wouldn't really need all those middlemen in between. So how does it work? It's basically a network of computers that all have the same history of transactions. And so instead of sort of there being one company with one database that holds all the information, the same sort of list is held by all these different people. Like you could have it on your computer and then it gets validated by everyone. And basically that turns into the next part of the list. So it's sort of constantly updating itself. So like, how do you make sure that it's secure? So it uses cryptography and that helps it basically encode all of the transactions. So you can't really see exactly what happened, but you know it happened because it's like a marker. So you could kind of like, I don't know, say trade you trade apples, but you would just see like random letters yeah, for it. Exactly. So you wouldn't be able to like track it, I guess. Exactly. That's cool. So it's kind of this like really big ledger or accounting system for all sorts of things that get traded, but instead of being owned by one company, it's owned by everybody. That's cool. Yeah. We're going to talk about blockchain technology. Have you heard of blockchain? I've heard of the words blockchain, but I'm not sure I know what it is. So when we were much smaller societies, you and I could trade in our community pretty easily. But as the distance in our trade grew, we ended up inventing institutions, right? Mm -hmm. If you use Uber or you use Airbnb or you use Amazon even, these are just digital marketplaces and platforms that help us facilitate an exchange of value. Mm -hmm. But today we actually have a technology that allows us to trade one-to-one -one, but at scale and it's called blockchain technology. There is some kind of interface for it. You could have an app um, or you could use your computer to do it. But instead of there being a company in the middle or what's helping you make that transaction is a bunch of software code. Okay. And so it's being run by all of these different computers that have a, like a node. So they're all running the same software and guaranteeing your transactions um, as they happen. I mean, I would assume this technology is 
taking away business or activity from these middlemen. In some cases, yeah, it is. And a lot of people in the financial industry in particular are looking at it from the banking side of how do we use this technology to trade things like Bitcoin or other tokens that um, are easier to use instead of today's currency. You know, a lot of people think about blockchain as Bitcoin mm -hmm. because it's sort of in the news a lot and it's this new cryptocurrency and it's kind of exciting, but we're actually seeing a lot more use cases for blockchain that aren't around the currency side. They're more around how do you take any asset mm -hmm. and be able to trade that using the same technology. Is there a mechanism for verifying that person A is a legitimate seller or producer of the item? So today, a lot of people are working on how to create identity structures that leverage blockchains. And one of the tools for doing that is being able to cryptographically sign um, for a given attribute. So your government could sign that you have a U.S. passport or a university could sign that you are a currently enrolled student. And you could then dole out that information and control it yourself and be able to show people those certifications on an as-needed basis. So today we're going to talk about blockchain technology. Okay. Have you ever heard of blockchain? I have. Uh, whenever we have a transaction and let's say I buy something from you, this information gets logged and it gets verified by a third person or third party. And then um, if like all this information verified and it all matches, right, the transaction goes through without any intermediary basically right and it gets stored and when we make further transactions this information is already embedded it's in the in the ledger yeah that's exactly right and you can append it you can sort of add new information that's more current but you can't actually go erase anything absolutely right the way the technology is changing nothing's gonna be like it used to be and there's no like firm and then the buyer and the seller and it's basically we'll have to rewrite the, a lot of rules and economics as well for sure. A lot of the assumptions won't hold true. Same Absolutely. with who are the who are the actors? It's not just people anymore, it's machines. Absolutely. We're gonna have to create entire new concepts of how they do trade and how they work with us too. What kind of barriers or roadblocks would you imagine are gonna happen in the blockchain space? So at least uh, when uh, we, we talk about uh, Bitcoin, there are some trust issues, there have been some hacks and uh, so there is obviously a need to, to work on, on the trust and feeling that it's, uh, it's a safe technology. Yeah, one of the problems that Bitcoin has faced is Bitcoin's getting stolen or mm -hmm. lost. But a lot of that actually comes from people trying to re-centralize Bitcoin mm -hmm. in different ways, making themselves actually a pretty easy target. Absolutely, so education will be a big part before we actually can use the technology in, in a wide sense, right? Yeah to actually transition into the mainstream and, and make it useful for average people to use, we're going to need to make sure we have um, a lot more education, a lot more standards, and probably work with a lot of enterprises to create sort of the user experience around this being a technology that is safe and usable and understandable. What is the current state of blockchain in your understanding? What's gonna have to happen next? The current state is in is the research state and it's being uh, developed to, to be applied in many, many areas. It might be used almost everywhere to where like we won't even imagine how we live without it. But I'm, I'm not sure where it's going to go. I mean, no one really knows, right? Well, we have a lot of uh, public blockchains, like we have Bitcoin, we have the <laughs> Ethereum network, NXT, but a lot of companies and consortiums are getting together to build private blockchains, so ones that are more closed off at first and then may evolve into a public network when people feel comfortable using it. And some are also proof of concepts out in the real world, projects in energy and in pharmaceuticals and in retail and lots of different fields are starting experiments. and. We'll see in the next few years how all of those interact and what we learn about the best use cases for blockchain and what it means for trade. So tell me your version of a technical definition of blockchain. 
A technical definition of blockchain is that it is um, a persistent, transparent, public, append-only ledger. Um, so it is a system that you can add data to and not change previous data within it. Um, it does this through a mechanism for creating consensus between scattered or distributed parties that do not need to trust each other, but just need to trust the mechanism by which their consensus is arrived at. Um, in the case of blockchain, it relies on some form of challenge such that no one actor on the network is able to solve this challenge consistently more than everyone else on the network. So it randomizes. Yes, yeah, it randomizes the process and in theory ensures that no one can force the blockchain to accept a particular entry onto the ledger that others disagree with. One that uh, relies on a mechanism for a peer-to-peer -peer network that can maintain updates to the ledger and then verify those updates in such a way that it is impossible to defraud and impossible to alter after the fact. And do you see it as defining a new discipline of kinds or where, where are we going to see blockchain emerge in the real world first? I mean, just so like as an example, one thing that I think about a lot in terms of possible blockchain applications is electricity. Right, the next generation of distributed smart grid technology, effectively. Sure, and people because, are working on that yes, already. Yes, yeah, 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 exactly. And it's this very fruitful area of research, and you can find yourself looking like 20 years out, right, where you have an enormous number like of electric cars. You have all of these batteries. Like that's essentially um, a distributed peak load power grid, right? Like the cars are getting plugged in and unplugged at different times. If you have a mechanism that is able to automatically and autonomously be distributing power based on batteries that are scattered throughout the grid um, that are being used for other purposes. Their owners don't even necessarily need to be aware. You begin to have something that looks like a much more viable society that still has a lot of electricity needs but is able to base that much more on renewables, is able to make up the difference during peak load periods or during differences in weather, that is able to have power much closer to where it's needed rather than having to be distributed over great distances. Like, that's something that would be an enormously hard problem to solve. And it's not that the blockchain makes it easy, but it makes it possible. A lot of people are seeing blockchain in the news and mm. maybe seeing a lot of sort of initial coin offerings, this sort of monetization <laughs> opportunity yes. around blockchain mm -hmm. and are getting very excited about it. Now, some of that excitement is, is real and should be you know, mm -hmm. encouraged, but some of it is also hype. How do you feel about the hype cycle around blockchain today? I'm glad you mentioned initial coin offerings um, because for me those really exemplify the sort of the, the problem that we're having at this exact moment. They are a, uh, an idea with enormous potential significance down the road. However, the promise of the initial coin offering has been kind of hijacked into this string of like basically pump and dump scams or sort of desperate gold rush schemes. The faster that we can we can shift from this this fantasy that it is going to make you rich in a sort of you know 1920s tulip bubble kind of way um, is is the, is the sooner that we can get into people honestly and I mean this like with all the hope in the world, people being disappointed in blockchains. Like, oh, I didn't get rich. It's just being used now to make it easier to transact goods and services safely across borders. This isn't exciting at all. And then we'll see that like become part of the everyday infrastructure of the world in a way that I think will be very significant. But I think it is now almost every aspect of it that's connected with the concept of money is wildly overhyped. Um, and, uh, well, and it also yeah. creates a problem, which is people get a lot of excitement around it, and yes. then they, they're waiting for the world to change, yeah, right? Where, yeah. where is this technology? Why haven't I seen anything change yet? <laughs> yes, yes, and it's yeah. because we've had a lot of PR, a lot of proof of concept, but yeah. truthfully, this is more like a science, right? Yes. It will develop, it will take five years, it will take 10 years. That kind of time is necessary. One of the areas that brought me to supply chain research is the fact that we're, we're not just gonna see blockchain emerge, we're gonna see artificial intelligence continue to evolve. We're gonna see connected devices and this sort of growing internet of things, mm -hmm. machinery that can do a lot more and have a wallet and transact on their own. And so I actually think a lot of where blockchain and other technologies are headed is this interesting synergy that will help us elevate the kinds of institutions we've used in the past and yeah. cobble together yeah. to create that identifiable 
verifiable trust. Yes, and one of the most interesting ideas to me that came out of the currency side of the blockchain project was the notion around like coloring coins, right? Assign properties to a particular coin, mm -hmm. um, and in particular to assign those properties in ways that would allow you to do things like bring in the graph of previous transactions. Right. You know, there's, there's sort of an, an obvious application for this, which is something that would look a little bit like an extreme version of like a boycott, divestment, and sanctions kind of approach, right? A model where it's sort of like, I will not touch money. My wallet it will automatically not touch money that has been right. exchanged with the following as a sort of very extreme way of cutting those things out. But there's also ways in which I think that could be applied to, to clearing out the entire logistics process of many kinds of bad actors. But trying to make a supply chain better in some ways relies a lot on whose version of better that is and exactly sure. kind of what gets qualified, but also how that is quantified within, say, some kind of like smart contract system. There's multiple ways that I could see this backfiring, and one is the ways in which that is implemented, for example, leaving certain kinds of bad behavior untouched or unanalyzed, or one that feels even more dire to me in some ways is creating an extremely inflexible, con like, because human contracts, legal contracts, are actually very flexible. Like, there's a lot of kind there's of room to move and renegotiate. And, yeah. yeah, but we, we already have real world versions of some of these nightmare scenarios, right? Where like your kid has a medical emergency and you can't unlock your car because you're two days behind on payments for it. And so the car system will no longer respond to the app mechanism that you're supposed to be able to use to drive so it. So barrier being sort of a rigidity in yes. the structures that maybe don't accommodate real life scenarios very well. As you and I have been talking, one of the things that keeps coming up is that we tend to hold novel technologies to an unrealistically high standard in terms of what they are supposed to deliver, rather than comparing them to actually existing systems where we can begin to see the possibility that even like a slight incremental improvement would still be an enormous gain. The system we have today is also broken, <laughs> right? Yes, and that yeah. it's, it's hard to compare it to some perfect future, just like we compare um, you know, autonomous vehicles to this very high standard. Yeah. Because machines are doing it, it should be perfect, right? Yeah. There should be zero car deaths. <laughs> yes. And yeah. when you say, well, there's hundreds of thousands, millions of you know, car deaths on the road due to human error mm -hmm. today, I think we're in a similar place. We're going to see problems with this technology, and we are going to need to develop multiple kinds of standards that also have yeah. some flexibility. Um, but it's it's going to also be a, a version, a system that mm. uh, allows us to fix some of the things that are broken today. Blockchain may sound complicated, but at its core, it's just another tool for humans and eventually robots and other kinds of identities to trade at scale and make that trade more decentralized. And it's part of our future, so it's important that people have these kinds of conversations and start to learn about it.